You're very welcome to this latest webinar discussion as part of the IIEA's 30th anniversary celebrations. My name is Dan O'Brien and I'm delighted to welcome the heads of three of Europe's leading think tanks to discuss the role of think tanks, past, present and particularly future. Before I introduce our lineup this lunchtime, let me briefly run through some housekeeping. Uh, we're going to kick off with some opening questions to each speaker who will have five minutes or so to respond. And then we'll go into discussion. Uh, we do want to hear from you in the audience and encourage you to submit views and questions in writing through the Zoom Q&A function at the bottom of your screen. It, it's really important that we get to hear from non-think tankers who consume think tanks, think tank services about what we can do better. We'd also ask you to identify yourself in your organization if applicable, and also that you try to keep your questions brief so we can get through as many as possible. A reminder that the discussion today is fully on the record. You can also get involved in, in the discussion on Twitter, and we encourage you to use the hashtag uh, IIEA30. Let me turn to our speakers in alphabetical order. Rosa Balfour is Director of Carnegie Europe. Her fields of expertise include European politics, EU institutions, and foreign and security policy. Prior to joining Carnegie, she was Senior Fellow at the German Marshall Fund of the United States and also served as Director of, of the Europe in the World Program at the European Policy Center in Brussels. Her current research focuses on the relationship between domestic politics and Europe's global role. Robin Niblett is Director and Chief Executive of Chatham House in London, a position he has held since January 2007. He is currently co-chair of the World Economic Forum's Global Futures Council on Geopolitics, and he previously served as chair of the Experts Group for the 2014 NATO Summit and chair of the British Academy's Steering Committees of Languages for Security Project 2013. Before joining Chatham House from 2001 to 2006, Robin was the Executive Vice President and Chief Operating Officer of the Washington-based Center for Strategic and International Studies. Natalie Tocci is Director of the Institute of International Affairs in Rome and Honorary Professor of the University of Tübingen. She is a Special Advisor to the High Representative and Vice President of the European Commission. She previously served as Special Advisor to the uh, same role in, when Federica Mogherini held that role. Um, and she wrote the European Global Strategy and worked on its implementation. Previously, she held positions at the Center for European Policy Studies in Brussels, the Transatlantic Economy, Academy Washington, and the Robert Schumann Center for Advanced Studies in Florence. You're all very welcome, and thanks for taking the time to join us. Let me also kick off the questions in, in alphabetical order and start, uh, Rosa, if I may, with you. You've written on, on the role of think tanks in an age of anti-expertise. And you said that this backlash against experts has happened at a time when the world's in mo most in need of those experts. What, what do you think explains this anti-expert uh, view? And do you think it'll last or are there any signs that it's changing? Thank you very much, Dan, for your question. Thank you also for inviting me um, here. I have to say, I wrote that paper back in 2017 and that was in the wake of Brexit and uh, Trump's election, where we saw uh, lies and so-called alternative facts, as the um, as Trump's spokesperson said, um, dominate the public uh, debate. So it led me to a bit of a crisis as to what was our role as think tankers and had we failed in our key uh, jobs, in our key mission uh, with respect to society. Um, I think, I mean, there the are many reasons for which um, uh the this anti-expertise um uh, backlash has come to be i actually think we're, we're at the moment we're going through a phase in which expertise has all of a sudden been re-evaluated because of coronavirus all of a sudden we've become very um um affluent in uh, pandemics viruses and statistics etc um and so i think there's been a re you know, a re-evaluation of the role of expertise. But I think the general problem and the general statement that I made in that paper is still valid. I and mean, there are two points um, that need to be made. The first is that we live in a world of increasing complexity. And the second is that we're living in a world of, of a poor political leadership. Now, these are, they sound like platitudes, so let me just expand a little bit. Um, the complexity 
um, of the world is because uh, of globalization, because of you know, new trends. These trends are cutting across uh, policy areas. Uh, they're cutting across boundaries. Uh, so just to give an example, um, you know, addressing, devising policies to fight the climate crisis is about agriculture and food as much as it is about energy. Um, climate problems don't stop at boundaries, they, cross, cross, um, uh, they cut across them. Addressing them requires multi-level interventions from the local to the international. Um, and indeed, global governance has become more complex because of this. And they also require solutions that have a time frame that is longer than politics. Um, the big challenges today require intergenerational solutions and policies. And while this world is becoming more complex, and of course add to that the, the rise of technology, the politics um, have also been transforming themselves in a way which I would argue is not conducive to addressing com complexity. Um, we all know about the end of ideology with the end of the Cold War. Um, and we've seen in recent years very volatile politics in most countries, in most advanced democracies, not all, but in most advanced democracies. Electoral cycles have become much shorter. Um, politicians' horizons are very, very short term. Um, and uh, traditional party politics are increasingly challenged by new actors, um, including populist actors that adopt um, anti-expertise language. Um, uh, they, they are increasingly challenging traditional um, politics. So with this and with the loss of trust, with the rise of populism and with these short electoral cycles and a political class which is really focused on getting through the next, elect next electoral cycle, this context is not very conducive to designing policies that address the complexity of planetary challenges. So I think this is the, the context in which alternative facts uh, came, to, um, came to, to play a bigger role. Um, and this is where, at least in my reflection, people like us who have been, and the three of us have actually spent most of our professional lives in think tanks, we need to think about what our role is. Um, and I, I do think some of us have perhaps uh, been a little complacent about our role, have enjoyed living or, you know, getting, um, 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 mingling in this environment of policymakers and perhaps have not taken the step back to look at what our role is, what, how our expertise can be of value. And, and, and this is, you know, I'd just like to make a few statements on this. Um, precisely because of these two challenges, short politics, long challenges, long issues, long problems. Uh, think tanks alongside research institutions and academic institutions, universities, agents, technical agencies, I mean, we're not alone in this, really need to decode the complexity and, and present analysis and facts in, in ways that are capable of identifying policy solutions, ways that are capable to speak to politics and identify path, paths forward which are realistic but also creative. And, and, and they can bridge this gap between the short-termism of politics, which I think will be hard to be bridged through politics itself. Um, but also it, between, so the gap between this short-termism of politics and the long-termism of the, some of the challenges that need to be addressed. Um, in order to do so, um, there are several things that we need to focus on, um, integrity, independence, quality of research, um, and I think a critical relationship with power. And perhaps that's where think tanks have not always been um, um, true to their, to their mission. Uh, we step in the circles of power, we play roles um, advising, um, we rely on, the, on these relationships also to have information. But when is it that we can step out of the bubble and look at things separately? When is it that we can, um, that we can uh, take an outsider view as to what the challenges are? And I think one of the reasons for which think tanks don't enjoy much trust or much credibility is precisely because they're seen as part and parcel of the elite. And it's important, 
I don't think we are part and parcel of the elite, but it's important to be um, to be true to one's mission and ensure that even from an outside perspective, we do not appear to be part and parcel of that elite. So it's, it's very important to find that balance, which, as I said, is based on professionalism, integrity and awareness of what our mission is. Um, I'll leave it there for now and then perhaps we can say more later. He was involved in the media and has written columns for many years. It was a balance to be struck that, you know, in, in the media, you can be more direct and critical of power. And that's a, that's the role of the media. But think tanks, we're, we're not into kind of gotcha moments with politicians. It's more to tease out information. Is there really that big a problem there? The media does its thing and scrutinizes politicians and think tanks have a more, um, let's say, a le less confrontational role. And sometimes I know that can appear to be uh, a little too cozy with politicians, but is, is that not really the role of a think tank to, to, to have that less confrontational role with policymakers and politicians? Are you asking me? Yes. Yeah. I do think we need to have a less confrontational role. There, there needs to be a conversation, but we are looking at things differently compared to the politicians. Um, and that's where the professionalism, the research uh, methodologies, the clarity of methodology, uh, the ability to dig in deeper um, into issues. And I think crucially, um, think, tanks can, think tanks can bring to the conversation a mix of um, general knowledge with specialist knowledge, which politicians are never going to have. So these, you know, we bring to the conversation a different set of skills and a different perspective. Um, and it is, as I said, a conversation rather than holding to account um, politics, which is the role of the media. But let's not forget that the media, too, has been going through a long period of crisis. Um, and so often these roles are conflated. Often these roles are not clear to, to a broader public, um, which is why I think it's important to make the statement about what our mission is and what our role is and, and pursue it through our work. Robin, just picking up on that point, you, you've raised the question of whether think tanks should be set themselves up as completely objective sources of information or analysis, or have a set of values that they want to, to communicate and are, are maybe take a slightly um, partisan, or perhaps the wrong word, but take a particular position on something. Um, do you have a view on that? Have your thoughts evolved on that? Thanks very much, Dan, and pleasure to be here with, with Rosa and Natalie and to be celebrating with all of you IIEA's 30th uh, anniversary. Fantastic uh, achievement. Think tanks don't uh, survive just by some sort of dint of right. I think we've all got to earn our presence. So great uh, to be celebrating this moment with you. Um, and great that you're having this conversation about uh, our ecosystem and our world. And I was very struck by a number of Rose's comments, which I thought were very pertinent to, to the debate today. To, to your question to me, um, well, it's, as most things, it's not either or. Um, and like Rosa, yeah, I wrote a piece about the future of think tanks. I think it was at the tail end of 2018, uh, heading up to our own uh, centenary anniversary last year. And, uh, I really talked about Western think tanks because I think you do have to draw some distinction between institutes around the world and the political ecosystems in which they live and work. And we all do reflect in various different ways our political ecosystems. Um, I, undoubtedly, there is a key role for us to play providing objective long-term analysis, uh, understanding, explaining complexity, looking over the horizon, all of the points that Rosa quite correctly raised. And, and as she noted, I think those skills, uh, that role that we can play is all the more important today in, in a much more polarized society. And where even media, the financial pressures as much as anything is getting pulled into that debate. And the gotcha moments that you described, Dan, are often part of making sure that you'll be noticed. Um, so uh, sometimes I think as think tanks, we need to have in mind the constructive solution and having constructive, if critical, relationships with uh, policy communities uh, is an important balance to strike. I do think, however, and this is the point I made in, in the article I did for International Affairs, is that um, it is important as we look to the future that we don't simply hide behind the mantle of analysis, that our exclusive role is to be sources of objective analysis. We are all involved, all of us, to the best of my knowledge, certainly in the West, 
in providing policy solutions. We use the platform of the analysis um, uh, to be able to come up with those ideas that are a bit longer term, that are maybe not trapped by political bias, uh, that take complexity into account. Um, and if that's our role, um, we need to make sure that policy communities, governments and others hear us. And if you're simply out there criticizing every step, and that's the extent of your contribution, uh, eventually people switch off. So uh, there is an element to which we're already in, in the mix, I suppose, on the policy side, um, and uh, at least putting forward ideas. But your question goes one step beyond that, and, and I thought I should as well, which is, do we stand for something? Not necessarily promote, and I'll explain the difference between promoting and standing in my mind in a minute, but I think it is important that we in think tanks and liberal democracies, I'll take out the word Western because it's not just in, let's call it the, the Euro-Atlantic West that, that um, liberal democratic institutions and, and political systems exist. Um, in that bigger context, um, we do stand for certain things. Uh, and I think interestingly enough, there is as close as I've seen in the post-Cold War period, um, the emergence of an ideological standoff right now between those governments that uh, give primacy to the role of the state and see citizens as in essence uh, delivering to the sovereignty collectively of that state and that there are collective outcomes that government is responsible for delivering and the citizens then benefit from. But it's, it's a subservient relationship in essence for the citizens to the state to the systems that I've been brought up in, I think all of us have been brought up in, that we exist in, in liberal democracies, where governments serve the people and serve the citizens. And of course, you want them to be good, you want them to be professional, um, but ultimately you want to be able to chuck them out um, and change them when you need to and hold them to account. Um, and uh, I think that think tanks in liberal democracies, our three institutions, uh, our four, uh, three represent on the panel and, and you are all part of that uh, community um, in the sense that we live in societies where we believe in the importance of the separation of powers. However, that might be designed and is designed very differently in different political systems. Um, we believe in the rule of law um, and the rule of law is only possible if you've got separation of powers. Uh, otherwise, you end up with rule by law if it's all part of the same structure. Uh, I think we believe very much in strong civil societies, uh, in openness over secrecy, um, a competitive media, independent is always a complex term depending on how they're funded, but certainly a, a competitive media that is not controlled uh, by the state. Um, and it's not just that we live in those systems, I believe, uh, and I think history has shown, certainly to date, that societies that live under those principles and operate under those principles are able to deliver better outcomes for their citizens over the long term and in a sustainable way. And I add those two terms very importantly, because a lot of people will say, well, China's doing very well. What's the problem there? Um, they have, uh, in essence, citizens having uh, given control, should we say, to the state, and China seems to be doing well. I would simply say I will judge any country once they're through the middle income trap. Um, uh, and we will see how uh, that particular system of government copes. Um, but I think for those in liberal democracies, which have tended to achieve levels of uh, economic opportunity for the bulk of their citizens, that is better than others. Clearly, uh, we are grappling now with the inequities uh, built up over the last 20 years. And our democratic systems are fighting out uh, the solution. And it's a messy, contested period. But I would still rather sit in the space where that is contested. Um, and we are part of the contest. And I think this is the, my last point on this, is that as think tanks, we are civil society. Our voices and the credibility of our voices depend on the existence of separation of powers, the rule of law, openness over secrecy. Otherwise, in a way, we're not think tanks. We're simply vehicles for either government positions or the positions of other groups. And we're not autonomous or independent, whatever term uh, you want to give. So I suppose I, I wanted to make a call. And it struck me as one that we went through mentally at Chatham House as we talked about this, that it's not simply about being uh, providing objective analysis. 
if you're in the space also of using that platform for providing ideas for solutions, somewhere in that solution set is the governance structure under which those solutions are provided. And we do, by very dint of being autonomous independent institutions, stand for societies uh, that allow space for institutions like ours to exist and offer those ideas and offer them critically and be critical about governments if we think they're not going the right way. As Rosa said, that's part of our role. We need to keep the space to do that. Well, you can only do it within societies where that role is not only appreciated, but protected and, 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 and nurtured. Um, as I said, I don't think, and this is where I'll finish, our job isn't necessary to advocate. I believe it's best, it suits our system. Clearly other countries and other parts of the world have different political systems. Their think tanks have to operate in different ways. Again, we could use China as the, as, as the classic example in that space. Um, but at the very least, what we should be doing is contributing to the role that is very much, I think, on the agenda of a number of liberal democratic governments today, and I'd include the Biden administration and, and uh, European governments and, and others, um, in protecting what we've got. So we may not need to promote these values to others because they may be going through their own journeys and they may or may not get to, to where we are or want to get to where we are. Um, but at the very least, I believe we need to play a very strong role in not allowing the rights that we benefit from as institutions to be taken away by corrupt um, or, or overly centralized forms of more authoritarian government, which is definitely one of the challenges of the day. So I believe this is a really important set of principles to stand for today. And I think it is our role to do so. A follow up, Robin, how do you engage with those Am I unmuted? Yes. Yep, no, I can hear you. How do you engage with those uh, regimes that don't share those liberal democratic values, specifically as a think tank? Uh, you know, we've had multiple Chinese speakers. We recently had the Hungarian justice minister for which we came in uh, for some criticism. Um, but in terms of as a think tank, uh, where is the line about platforming, deplatforming? Who do you say uh, is a legitimate speaker and not a legitimate speaker? Very. Very important question. We've been going through, maybe like you, similar conversations at least over the last year or two uh, on these precise questions. And, and we have a policy, our principles of independent research and convening, which we constantly keep an eye on to try to make sure that we're uh, uh, living by the values, but playing our role. And the, this is how I distinguish it. You talked about speakers. Now. I think as policy institutions, we have a really important role in promoting open debate, hearing all views. Uh, one of our founders talked about the importance of mutual understanding being at the core of the role of Chatham House and other institutions uh, like the ones represented on this call. Um, and uh, therefore, I would have a very high bar on deplatforming. Um, you know, I got a Holocaust denial. I mean, you can take your, your pick. There are, there are spaces within which we are not going to provide a platform at Chatham House, even for debate because it will be manipulated and used. But it is a very high bar. I think in general, our role is to promote debate, even with governments that we may uh, disagree with, disagree with their policies and disagree with their systems of governance and of government. But part of our job is to bring different perspectives together, to debate, for them to understand our standpoint, for us to hear theirs, um, and ideally be part of progress, if I can use that term, certainly avoiding conflict, through misunderstanding, um, but also allowing constructive debate challenge. We never, I'm sure like all of you, we never allow people to come and just give speeches. You have to take questions. And those questions are not uh, uh, chosen, if you see what I'm saying, uh, uh, beforehand. So if you're gonna provide that space for debate and those speakers, there has to be challenge if it's public and it should be frank if it's private. But we're not into saying particular countries can't have people come over. And I remember hosting the Hungarian foreign minister myself two or three years ago, and, and we had a very intense debate, and it was good. Uh, and I heard some things I hadn't heard before, and hopefully we, we shared some views that maybe he hadn't. However, there is a line between debate, uh, discussion, and analysis. And just because you host debates that are inclusive and that are giving the opportunity for people to know what's going on, does not mean you then pull your punches in your analysis or in your recommendations. And if what you advocate or what you, you, you promote in your analysis, or even the analysis you undertake, 
leads to then speakers not choosing to come or may lead perhaps to your scholars not being able to visit particular countries or means you lose funding or whatever, then my view would be so be it. That's where you have to draw the line. Um, uh, again, I talked about standing. If our point is independence of thought, we're part of civil society, open and service secrecy, all of those elements. As long as you stand true to those principles, you can have an engaged, inclusive conversation, but not compromise the principles at the same time. Thanks, Robin. Natalie, very much continuing that line and talking about specifically one country, the, the rising superpower, China. Earlier this year, uh, many people in, or a number of people in the, in the research field in Europe uh, were sanctioned by the regime in uh, Beijing. Um, could you maybe share some thoughts on, on how significant that a moment that was, uh, what it means for research in Europe on China, what it means for um, how we analyze the relationship between Europe and China? Well, let me start off by saying that I think that particular incident uh, highlighted some of the broader points that we've been discussing uh, up until now. I mean, that particular incident uh, all of a sudden positioned us as think tanks as being not simply sort of outside observers of the way in which uh, the international system is, is evolving, uh, but as actors within it. Uh, and, and, and being actors within it uh, comes with um, all sorts of, of rights as well as responsibilities. Um, so, you know, I think in that particular instance, you know, what, what we did in terms of responsibility is actually rally around uh you know there, there was a, a, sort of a group of think tanks that got together uh to express its its positions and its, its kind of opposition to what china was uh, was doing and you know it was one of the very rare occasions in which we did so not simply because you know i mean often it happens that think tanks uh, get together on particular calls on particular subjects uh but this was not about something else happening outside. It was something happening to us. And if it happens to one of us, it happens to, to all of us. So I think it was an important sort of assumption of responsibility of, of, of who we are in, in, in the system. Uh, and, uh, and therefore sort of cognizant of the fact that uh, given that we are actors in the system, I mean, this kind of goes uh, back to some of the points that, that both Robin and uh, Rosa were, were mentioning. I think it's important to us to reflect um, more about, you know, who we are and what is it that we can do and what is it that we can't do. And I think that the distinction that Robin was making uh, between sort of standing and, and promoting was, was a crucially important distinction. I mean, the truth of the matter is that as think tanks, we cannot exist, I mean, given what we mean, what we mean by think tanks, huh? uh, we cannot exist in a system that does not provide for certain rights, for rule of law, for separation of powers. I mean, our very identity, I mean, beyond what we may think about, you know, the Middle East as opposed to China, as opposed to, you know, anything, you know, climate. Uh, the point is, what are the preconditions that political uh, preconditions and the sort of value-based preconditions that simply enable us to exist. And when we see that those principles are being attacked, as was in particular the case over, uh, over this incident, but you know, I mean, th this was coming from outside uh, in countries like, you know, given that we've been citing Hungary, Hungary um, the, the attacks are coming from inside. Huh? And actually, one could argue the extent to which this external repression is actually also connected and a quote unquote source of inspiration uh, for uh, internal forms of repression within liberal democratic countries. I mean, to what extent there is a connection between these things, not in terms of a direct connection. I mean, I'm not arguing here that whatever uh, China tells kind of Hungary what to do vis-a-vis -vis its think tanks, but in, in terms of representing a model of government, basically, uh, that is a quote unquote inspiration to autocrats in our own 
liberal democratic systems. So I think it's important for us as think tanks to sort of sit back and reflect about what is it that this moment is actually teaching us. And I think basically it seems to me that we've been moving through two, possibly now three different stages. So, you know, once upon a time we uh, lived in, in the world of, uh, I mean, to go back to some of the words that Robin was, was mentioning, a promotion. I mean, we lived in our nice, wonderful international liberal order uh, in which indeed, you know, as think tanks, we uh, didn't necessarily, I mean, in fact, it's not our role to promote, you know, promote in the advocacy sense of the term, uh, specific policy solutions, but indeed we more broadly promoted, I mean, we were part of that soft power, in a sense, uh, apparatus um, that liberal democratic countries basically uh, had and, and used. Um, and so it was really about, in a sense, spreading those, those norms, those values externally. We then went through a phase uh, where I think, you know, sort of Rosa and, and Robin's uh, contributions, I mean, their written contributions were really embedded in, in a phase in which, you know, there was this kind of rude awakening to the fact that, hey, you know, we used to think that these values were not questioned. Yes, there was a questioning of different policy solutions, and that was the space within which we debated and we provided uh, expertise. And I mean, that was kind of, um, in a sense, kind of working within the confines, the value-based confines that no one really questioned. No one questioned that democracy was a good thing. No one questioned that human rights and international law were kind of good things. Uh, and, you know, we, we had different ideas as to, as I said, you know, what to do about different policy questions, but within that same, uh, that, that same mental space, if you like. All of a sudden, there was this kind of rude awakening to the fact that, hey, you know, what we thought was unquestioned actually started being questioned. And that was the stage in which we entered into this phase of protection, as, as Robin was, was, was mentioning, which initially, and I think, and I'll come to China, <laughs> which initially was really articulated as, as, and I think it still is to a large extent, as a threat from within. It was uh, the kind of, you know, the rude awakening with Brexit and, the, and Trump and, uh, you know, Salvini and Le Pen and Orban. I mean, it was the sort of rise of nationalist populism within the West, if you like, that all of a sudden put us, if you like, as think tanks in a completely different condition than the one that we were in basically pretty much, you know, for the duration of our existence. Uh, because even if obviously, you know, we've gone through, you know, various stages of, of change in the international system, and in particular, if you like, Cold War and post-Cold War, but we always lived within that space in which those values were not questioned. All of a sudden, the questioning was coming. It was coming from within. And so we started as think tanks also um, engaging far more actively in different kinds of activities. All of a sudden, it was not only about writing policy papers and providing policy advice. It was this huge investment in communication, in education. Uh, I mean, we have all become sort of, you know, far more media savvy than we were. Uh, all our, you know, our institutes invest a lot in, you know, social media. And, and why do we do this? We do it because in our own little way, and of course, you know, then the question is to what extent through these efforts, do we really reach out to those that do have different views? I, I saw earlier, actually, in the uh, in the questions that there was a question about algorithms and how to kind of you know uh, navigate that problem. Of course, it's not just our problem; it's uh, it's everyone's problem. So obviously, the problems still exist. But the point that I'm trying to make here is that all of a sudden, and it's something you know that really kind of dates back only whatever, not not more than a decade we started entering into, into this mental condition saying our role as think tanks is not just the, uh, the, the promotion, it is as much the protection. Uh, and we have to protect because this is what we stand for. Again, using some of uh, Robin's words uh, earlier. I think now, and here I come to the, to the China point, we're kind of entering a third phase in which the protection and the promotion actually sort of come, come together. So yes, there is this, um, uh, th th this question about the threat from within, 
But yes, indeed, we're increasingly cognizant of the fact that um, there is a threat coming from outside. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, there are, I mean, in the way in which the international system is crystallizing, and without wanting to sort of, you know, be too simplistic here, in a sense, a bit alabidon huh, of democracies versus autocracies, but it is true that there is something there. And obviously, there is a big fat gray zone uh, in between. But then part of the competition, quote unquote, is that of seeing what can be done to ensure that that gray zone made of the Indias and the Turkeys and, and alas, of the Hungries uh, and Poland's of this world, if you like, tilt more or come back more towards one side or the other. And, and so I think in, in, in this kind of world, what we will have to learn increasingly how to do as think tanks in a structural way is do the protection and the promotion at the same time. Uh, and these two things cannot basically exist without, without one another. Uh, and also do so, and here I'll end with the point that, that Rosa was making, cognizant of the role that we play. I mean, you know, this idea of kind of, you know, um, sort of the, 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 the speaking truth to power, if you like, uh, uh, argument. And, and, and you know, I don't think there's a silver bullet solution to this because I, I, I do think that um, in many respects, we are part of a certain establishment. Uh, and so, it, you know, the, the point is, where do you draw that line between what you are and you, in a sense, you are almost proud of, huh? because it is, it goes back to this question of values. Huh? Uh, so there's nothing to be shy about. Um, but, and, and in fact, I would say almost you have to be very open about it, uh, because indeed in the past there was almost less of a need to do so because everyone kind of adhered to those values. Now that those values are challenged, I think that we have to be very open in terms of you know, being explicit about what, what we stand for. But of course, cognizant of the fact that there is a, a potential trap there. I mean, and which is why I think that the way to navigate this, I mean, the, the trap meaning in a sense, ending up in kind of just speaking to, you know, to ourselves and, you know, sort of groupthink and, you know, all of the, you know, and then the algorithms, because obviously they also concern us as much as they concern others. Um, and so I think that the only way to navigate it, impossible as it is, is, is sticking to the last point that Robin was making. So the idea of being open to debate from everyone, I mean, so long as obviously everyone excludes those that obviously uh, advocate, uh, I think, violence in every shape or, or, or form. Huh? Um, but but it, as, as Robin was saying, you know, that, that bar, you know, so provided that bar and that bar's a really high bar is, is met, everything below there, uh, below, it, it is something that we have to be open to because it is the only way that we ourselves uh, avoid to the extent possible, as I said, on one hand, being aware and cognizant of what we stand for, uh, but also aware that our convictions are not shared by others. And we have to listen to those that don't share those convictions, not necessarily because we have to change our mind, uh, but because even that is an integral element of what it is that, that we are, because we are also for pluralism. Huh? Uh, I mean, that is another of the sort of basic and underlying principles that we stand for. So, uh, you know, as open as possible uh, to debate, but at the same time, very much and increasingly aware of, of, of who we are and therefore what we stand for. Uh, beginning to think that maybe a panel of people who were involved in think tanks before 1989 might be an interesting uh, idea. And I'm guessing that nobody here uh, was, so none of the panelists today was working for a think tank uh, during the last Cold War. Um, Natalie, just to, to follow up with you specifically on China, you know, it, it, it's not really possible to have, uh, you know, a debate with anyone close to the Chinese state or anyone who lives in China for fear of, you know, that the person is, is, is constantly concerned about what they might say and the repercussions uh, for that. And from the scholarly position in, in Italy or in Europe, can you really call yourself a China expert if you're not sure you'll ever be allowed back into the country or that if you say something that will prevent you getting visas to go, to go back? You know, how much of a difficulty does China is it is an exceptional case, really, 
Um, how much of a difficulty does that specifically raise? Do you have any perspectives from, from your own institute uh, on dealing with that? I mean, I would say it's, uh, in a sense, unfortunately, it's not that exceptional. I mean, you know, this is a debate that we had internally in the Institute. Um, and it began with, with a completely different case. I mean, it began with when Giulio Regeni was assassinated in Egypt. Um, and we had a, 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 you know, a sort of very complicated debate in the Institute, you know, where on the one hand, obviously, you know, as a director, I'm obviously responsible for the health and safety of, uh, of, of my researchers. Um, but what, what do I do? Do I prevent them from traveling? And, and the truth is that there is, unfortunately, an increasingly high number of countries. I mean, this goes to a broader discussion about, you know, the backsliding of democracy, etc. But there's an increasingly large number of countries where actually you kind of think twice. Uh, you don't quite know. You don't quite know. It's not just, as I said, it's not just China. It's... Um, you know, you're not 100 percent sure that if you go to Turkey, <laughs> you know, what, what, what happens? Huh? Um, and, and, and of course, China is, in a sense, is, you know, the sort of the, the extreme example, not at the moment, because, um, you know, you risk being assassinated, but, but because indeed, I mean, at the moment, you basically risk being sanctioned and not being allowed it. Uh, and I think this really puts us as researchers uh, in, in an extremely difficult condition because, as you say, on the one hand, you need to have access to uh, be able to, um, you know, sort of speak and write in, in, in a slightly deeper way than what, for instance, journalism does. Uh, so we don't want to end up simply writing and talking about things that we kind of read about uh, sitting comfortably at our, you know, in our desks. Um, on the other hand, obviously, we want to make sure that we are free. I mean, it goes back to this point about, about, about values, um, uh, you know, and therefore are free to sort of speak and say what, what we think. Um, and, and thirdly, I would say that the, the third difficulty lies in the fact that we have relatively little protection. You know, we don't belong to kind of big organizations. You know, we don't, uh, we're not... Uh, diplomats, and we don't, um, you know, we don't work uh, in international organizations. I mean, yeah, mind you, some some of those people also have problems, but you know, we don't work for big companies. Yeah, but you know, we are relatively unprotected, uh, and so you know, we, in a sense, in, in many respects, if, if some of these countries do want to pick on someone, again, to go back on, you know, to, to the example of uh, of a journey in Egypt, um, you know, they. they they pick on a student. Uh, they, you know, they, they they pick on a researcher uh, before they actually end up sort of torturing us and assassinating a diplomat, for example. Um, so you know, I, I don't have, I don't, to be honest, I don't have a solution uh, to to the problem because I think that all these three things are aspects that we need to bear in mind, and all of them are equally important. Some will tilt more towards the. Um, saying exactly what we think. Huh? Some will tilt more towards the, yes, saying it, but being, you know, sort of trying to avoid sort of unnecessary, um, you know, while sticking to the, to what one believes being, you know, the truth, huh? um, avoid um, sort of using, if you like, perhaps too many adjectives or, I mean, do you see what I mean? You know, you can say things and try and say them in a way which uh, is as, as neutral as possible, uh, but that will not necessarily kind of protect you from everything. But then again, if one doesn't do that, <laughs> then there's little point in doing what, uh, what we do as a profession. Uh, Rosa, Robin, I, I, you may have, this is a, you know, a big issue, it's not going away. You may have some thoughts on it. Mull on that, well, I just could sh shift tack a little to some of the questions that are coming in. Um, and three questions have come in around uh, how to communicate. Uh, Natalie, as you picked up, one was about algorithms in the media and how people uh, have, can pick up only the sort of news that validates their already existing positions. Emily Vinci, my colleague asks, is there a way for think tanks to try and get around that? 
to to get different viewpoints and, and more analytical um, ideas out there, uh, the papers, research, uh, publications, etc. Um, Robin, one of your colleagues in the world today, Roxana Relanu, if I'm pronouncing her name correctly, um, asks communications with the younger generation. Um, what can think tanks do there? And Brendan Walsh uh, mentions podcasts. Again, he um, asks about how, how how ideas can be communicated to people, um, those expert views to, to uh, an audience that sometimes may not be that interested in them. Thoughts, folks, on how you have changed your communications, uh, what you think you can do better? Um, Rosa, start with you. Yeah, I mean, one, the immediate outcome of the uh, communication pressure is that we write a lot of short pieces. <laughs> so alongside the long ones, we also write some short ones. And I, I, see, I see, you know, an added value and, and, and risks as well. And for me, the solution really is to do both. Um, the added value of writing short pieces is that really forces one to, to go to the hardcore. What is it that I'm saying and who am I saying it to? And then you can tweak your argument depending on the audience. But obviously, if you write sh writing shorter pieces, if you're contributing also to the to the media stream through opinion pieces, you're actually going out there, putting yourself out in the debate, because otherwise, you know, given the number of papers that think tanks produce, you know, very much a small number of people are actually going to read it, read those. The second thing, I think it's very important, and social media allows this. I mean, the, the question really is having a balance, a balance between um, researched, uh, footnoted, original pieces based on field work based on interviews, based on closed door conversations, et cetera. So that you need to have those, um, but then you also want to reach out to a broader audience. So the important thing is to, to find the balance. And I think reaching out to the broader, broader audience, I have certainly at, at a personal level, tried to do, um, try to step out of my environment. Um, and to do that means, or can mean engaging with different groups of people, um, and NGO community, for instance, is one which, and they have a very different perspective on government policy. Um, Non-European, I deal with Europe, European foreign policy, talk to the non-Europeans and how they see European foreign policy, that's also very critical. And again, do talk to different groups and not just to those socialized into the European uh, driven community. And definitely engage with the young, younger, the younger generations, whenever possible um, you know I, I try to accept invitations to speak to students not because i want to speak to them but i want to hear their questions because they have a different perspective and they they really push us to challenge some of the assumptions that we take for granted they challenge our bias you know we are of a certain age of a certain education we are, you know our friends and our working community is of a certain kind and we can't deny that so it's really important to step out of that. Um, so these are the ways I've identified to try and keep me on my toes um, and you know, obviously encourage my colleagues to do uh, similar exercises. And I think in that way, one learns to speak different languages. If you're gonna go onto the BBC or CNN or I did Voice of America the other day, you know, and explaining Europe to Americans, it's not easy, um, you know, on television. Um, you need to find a language which will be accessible and you need to understand what it is they're looking, what it is the interviewer is looking for and what it is you need to explain. And, and, and you learn the language with the profession. But then, of course, when you're communicating to your peer audience um, and to the policymakers, which I think continues to be our prime audience, by the way, uh, even, you know, notwithstanding our attempts to reach out and branch out and bring in, but our prime audience remains policymakers. There you need to be sharp, original, and bring knowledge that they don't have um, and perspectives that they don't have. But the two are very interconnected. It's a kind of feedback loop. Absolutely. And just picking up on something you said there, Rose, on the shorter analysis pieces and think tanks. Robin, has, has there been a kind of a blurring between highbrow media and think tank output? 
as think tanks have been able to publish directly, have needed conventional media less for op-eds. Um, you know, is, is there, are think tanks really becoming highbrow publishers and in some ways niche broadcasters as, as we've become over the pandemic period since we've been able to broadcast and, you know, do these events and access multiples of the audience we would traditionally have have got at the uh, at the at the at the institute itself the physical institute i think it's a good point there's i think through um <clears throat> through covid there's been an increasing blurring between as you noted uh, media organizations what they undertake um and think tanks i might say on the convening side in london what's notable is the extent to which now law firms and consulting firms and all sorts of groups convene um, and convene the same sort of people as we as institutes convene and often for round tables that are private or under the Chatham House rule or whatever. Um, and, uh, uh, you know, a lot of the media organizations now run conferences. The conferences then provide the content. The content is then put into the newspaper, you know, so it, it, there's a lot of blurring that's going on in that sense. I think some of the think tank short pieces and let's call them uh, news long reads um, are definitely uh, overlapping. Um, I do find reading our own stuff and that of my sister institutions, colleague institutions, I find that actually generally we, we go a little deeper. Um, there's less need to source constantly from others and then pack together, you can have a view from a person. I think one of the strengths of our institutions is we don't write, well, I'm speaking for Chatham House, I think it's the same Carnegie and EI, we don't write, you know, uh, uh, it's not a Carnegie piece or Chatham House piece or an EI piece, it is under the name of the author and that person has to carry the load. And that gives it a certain precision and focus and an angle that you won't always get in what in essence is a piece of reporting. And that distinction between reporting and bringing a whole variety of views together to sort of create a hologram of the situation and one person's insight, I think is an important distinction. We've got to hold on to it, in addition to what Rosa said about still providing that really sourced, uh, uh, detailed uh, uh, analysis. And by the way, of course, second point, that sourced a detailed analysis, a project that was done over a year or six months or researched over time, means that when you come out with your expert comment or your two pager, it is off the back of that deep knowledge. It isn't the thing you were sent over to write the article quickly on this issue or that one. But obviously there are a lot of journalists who go deep and do investigative and probably know countries better than we know them. Um, but still there's a different uh, audience and a different um, process and a kind of moving around rather than the kind of specialism you can get from uh, institutions like ours. Just on the wider audiences question and youth, if I can just touch that quickly, Dan, um, I know you've got a lot of questions to get through, but. I did want to say something about this just first of all because i think we ask ourselves a lot i'm sure we all do who are our main audiences what's the point point? and if you're trying to change the world and make it a better place i think at some level we're all trying to do that that's why we do the work we do um our traditional route had been to do it through the policy communities targeted really precise what one of my predecessors which i was called the rifle shot approach and, and you, you, you go for that moment where you can get that idea into a source and then it flows through policy beyond that. Today, of course, what you find is a lot of your policy communities where you want to target the rifle shot, they, they don't want to hear the brilliant idea. They want to know whether your idea has got resonance already in a bigger community. If they're going to pick it up. They want to know it's got legs, that it's got, uh, it's already had a bit of, of social media interaction or whatever. So ironically, it's not just having to do social media and podcasts and more media work in order to get to other audiences. We also need to do that to be relevant to our specialist policy audiences. So I think there's, there's, a, there's a big push for all these reasons for us, and we're all doing it, to do a lot more on social media. And I'm uh, very disappointed to hear that uh, Brendan has not been listening to the Chatham House podcast, but um, uh, I'm sure he'll get to uh, Natalie's and Rose as well after this. But um, no, look, I think we're all for better and worse in terms of our skill sets and our resources, um, uh, you know, making a big effort in that area. My last point, apart from the fact that we're all, you know, now got our e-readers and all sorts of online capacity and we use, you know, Google uh, support and all sorts of things. Um, I think the last point about young people is they don't just want to receive. You know, think tanks have traditionally been on send. We are experts. 
So even if we're dressing our expertise up in prettier clothes or more accessible clothes, we tend to send, you know, and, and project. Um, a lot of younger audiences these days want to own, they want to have agency for what they're hearing um, and uh, uh, what they're picking up. And so the question is, how do you make that transition? Um, again, I'm sure we're all doing different things. We, we've established a thing called the Chatham House SNF Collab, but the whole point is to create immersive content where others can then follow their own journey inside it rather than us telling them to go this way or that way. Um, uh, we uh, have a thing called Common Futures Conversation. We set up this dialogue between young people in Africa and Europe. The idea being that you don't tell them what's important. We help host them. We, we provide them with resources, luckily through a grant, to, to be able to do their own surveys and design themselves what they think is important. And then we kind of curate the conversation and help them then get greater uh, um, reach and reach out to, to more communities. So I suppose that the key point I wanted to make, uh, and this ties a little bit into uh, Roxanne's uh, question uh, to me as well, because uh, Roxana's uh, question is about uh, you know, the world today is in a way our vehicle for reaching out to those broader audiences. And we need to now make sure that has the immersive quality uh, uh, as well, because people don't just want to read, they want to own. And, and if we can help them own it, and it's, let's call it right, uh, which we think we are, then all the better. Natalie, just in, in terms of who your main audience is, um, is it mostly policymakers? And just an observation, I, I lived in Italy in the 1990s and uh, views on Europe were very positive, both amongst the political elite and, and at a popular level. There was really, everyone thought Europe was good. Over the past 25 years, there's been a really astonishing increase in Euroscepticism at a, at a, popular, at a, at a, a popular level in Italy. Many of my own friends are now adamantly uh, skeptical about, about Europe, not in the sense they want to leave, but very critical of many aspects of, of the EU. In terms of your communication as, as an international affairs think tank, any, any thoughts on why that's happened and the role of elite institutions, if I may say, such as your own, um, in, in communicating how Europe works to citizens? Well, I mean, it, it, it connects to some of the broader reflections that we were making earlier. I mean, you know, for, for us as an institute, founded by Altiero Spinelli, uh, realizing what, what you just said, Dan, was, was really the wake-up call. I mean, you know, all of a sudden, obviously, we couldn't just be uh, sort of, you know, concerned with policy advice, uh, advice uh, to, to policymakers across different uh, sort of geographies and, and issue areas. Um, because the politician, the policymaker in question, the, if you like, was beginning to stand for, I mean, going back to the point that I was making, the point that Robin was making earlier, was beginning to stand for different values. So it wasn't just the sort of Euroscepticism that was coming bottom up, it was as much coming top, top down. I mean, you know, for us, obviously, the sort of big trauma was uh, uh, at the time of the uh, government between uh, the Liga and, and the Five Star Movement. Uh, and that was really, if you like, the major wake up call that made us really kind of realize that indeed our audiences had to change. Uh, I mean, had to change, they had to enlarge. Uh, and so uh, this is why, in a sense, I think, and this kind of brings me to the communication point that I wanted to make. Um, I, I think one needs to do everything at the same time. You know, you need to engage in different, for instance, social media platforms. Why? Well, because we know that uh, different uh, social media platforms are used by different age groups. Uh, and so you can't do Twitter and not do Instagram. You know, uh, you kind of have to do both uh, because you're talking to, I mean, just to give an example, I mean, you're talking to different audiences, which means that you have to talk in a different way. Uh, you can't do social media and not do, if you like, uh, sort of traditional, if you like, not sort of, you know, sort of national or international media. Uh, and, and this is why we've become far more active on 
television, uh, national, international, radio, uh, than, than, than we were uh, in the past. And, and we sort of track the way we do it. Um, of course, do we know how much impact this has happened? I mean, this is always the million dollar question. No, we don't know. Uh, and it's extremely difficult <laughs> to get a sense of, uh, a, a, of the influence that you actually have. But at the same time, I think that this also passes through an element, if you like, of trial and error. So I think that we are all sort of navigating through the space in which we kind of know what we want to do. So we know, for instance, that we want to reach out more to the young, uh, younger generations. And so sort of Robin was citing and Rosa was citing some of the initiatives that they're doing. Um, you know, we've launched our EI Prize uh, that is really aimed again at sort of listening, to go back to a word that, that Rosa was mentioning, listening to them more than talking and, and speaking to them. Uh, and listening to their ideas and trying to bring them into the conversation. We've opened up our membership for a, a, a category of, of, of younger members that obviously, you know, sort of, uh, uh, I mean, not, not that it costs much, to be honest, to be a young member, even if you're an adult, but it costs less <laughs> um, if, you're, if you're under 30. So, I mean, in a sense, I don't know. So, you know, we've, we've obviously, you know, we've, we've sort of uh, launched our podcast series and we don't know how many of these things are uh, A, going to work in the long term, uh, what really has traction, what does not, because I think, you know, we're, we have all been doing this for relatively little. I mean, our institutions, you're 30 years old, uh, we, you know, we're, we're a little bit, bit older. Uh, Chatham House is, is a bit older than us. Um, but, you know, so given that we're all kind of relatively old, we've been doing this communication stuff for, what, 10 years? That's not much. Uh, so inevitably, there's an element of trial and error uh, in, in all of this. Um, but I think that to the extent that we realize now that it's a fundamental element of what we do that does not and should not detract from the research side, which is obviously what our beating heart will always be, um, to the extent that we manage, as we're doing today, kind of exchange thoughts and, and notes as much as possible, because we're all in this kind of, you know, as I said, trying to make an error phase, then I think, you know, sooner or later, we're going to gradually get it, get it increasingly right because we're not getting it wrong now but i'm sure we can do increasingly better moving forward and uh, you're, you're mentioning there natalie of, uh, of the reduced fee for younger people um uh, a colleague reminded me to say that uh, we have free membership for younger people um, fantastic even better important to get that across look we're, we're, we're up we're past two o'clock so just to finish on a couple of things um one question came in on brexit uh, the role of think tanks. Robin, you, you have to take that one, I think. Uh, Rosa, you mentioned um, integrity, uh, independence at the beginning. There's a question here about the optimal revenue model for think tanks so that they can maximize their independence and have that uh, ensure they have the speak truth to power uh, function. Maybe, uh, maybe throw that one to you to uh, conclude. Robin, Brexit, Chatham House, um, thoughts on, on how you you handled that over the past half decade? Yes, well, painful. Um, kept us busy, but uh, actually it was the classic example about do you serve as a forum for debate and, and how do you distinguish that from what you write? One of the uh, letters I had to deal with was from a, a group of quite senior individuals who took me to task for Chatham House having lost its independence uh, during Brexit. And I wrote back making the point that, uh, you know, we hosted Nigel Farage as well as Tony Blair, as you know, well as Chris Grayling and, uh, and uh, Amber Rudd and all sorts of people. Uh, you know, we'd, we'd taken all the views, we'd challenged them, um, we'd mixed them, etc. But I said, um, you know, in, when it came to writing and what people wrote, people wrote what they believed and they analyzed what they analyzed. And uh, the suggestion that was made to me that we should be publishing some positions on the other side, because otherwise we were not being independent, struck me as a complete misunderstanding of what independence is about. Um, the BBC got accused, as I'm sure some of you know, of this wonderful phrase, balanced bias. 
Yeah, when you do a bias, bias towards balance. Some people say, but other people say. Um, and our job, you know, whether it's on climate change or something else, isn't to say some people say this and other people say that. Ultimately, you, and I think one of the most important roles for Rosa, Natalie, me, uh, and others in our position is who we recruit. And you, and then the culture you set within the recruitment and to give people the space to uh, uh, pursue their intellectual knowledge and curiosity um, and not be telling them obviously what to write, but making sure you're picking people who aren't coming at things from a polemic standpoint. So uh, I would say uh, it was tough. I think there is the big question about, you know, do we reach out to all communities? I think this came up in one of the earlier questions, Dan, and I thought it was a very interesting point because we keep giving, how do you engage, I get asked this question, how do you engage more people who think differently, you know, in Chatham House's work. And again, my, my thinking is, if it's differently with intellectual curiosity, um, I'm all for it. But there's no point simply having quotas of people around the table to make up the quota in order to sort of create some type of balanced set of viewpoints. And it, it reminds me of this um, discussion I had with a senior British businessman quite a while ago, thank goodness, actually was a lawyer. So maybe I should be careful how I specify um, about climate change. And I'd given a talk and this person said at the end in front of others, you know, has Chatham House always been so, you know, uh, had such a liberal bias or something like that? And, and I didn't know what he meant. I so wish what he meant by liberal. But we talked about it afterwards and he made the point I'd gone on about climate change as if it was some thing, you know, that was already a received wisdom. And as I realized that obviously this person took me to task because they didn't believe it, that climate change was either happening or, or, or man, uh, woman, humanity made. Um, what it was, it's dawned on me that the analysis couldn't be right because he did not accept the solution. You know, this is, this is what you have to deal with quite often in our world is that people don't want the answer. And then they work back off not liking the answer into what is a fact or not a fact. If the fact means that the answer is not one you want, and for many people, people want is sovereignty. And if you want sovereignty, then the facts have to fit that. And that was the problem with Brexit as much. And I actually did a chart to show where the UK actually still had sovereignty, even though it was in the EU, and where it had decided to pool it or share it and where it hadn't. And, you know, it was, this actually was a sovereign act to decide you know, where you did and didn't do it. That was a choice of sovereignty in itself. But um, people didn't want the solution. Uh, they wanted to take back control and ultimately including over, over immigration. And if that was your answer, the facts had to fit it. So I don't know if I've answered the question, but it's been a very, it's a tough thing to go through. I think the, the big wake up for me was this, this issue between uh, people not wanting solutions and then refusing the facts. And then you've got to work out, should you really adapt yourself to that? I don't think so. I go back to knowing what you stand for and, and knowing what you, you know, we are experts. Let's be proud of it uh, on our stuff. Let's challenge ourselves, question ourselves uh, every minute of the day, but but um, always follow them what we, what we believe is right. I'll say one thing on funding, diversity. That's what I'll say on funding. If you want to be independent, you better have diverse sources. Otherwise, it's always risky. Um, Rosa, I'm, I, I, I doubt you disagree with that, but do you, do you want to elaborate on, on the funding? Yeah, no, I agree 100%. That is the key. Um, there have been quite a few um, investigations, uh, rumours, uh, issues about funding from governments, about funding from the private sector. It's very important that the funding model is diversified. So I think Yai and Chatham House are both membership based, for instance, it's important that alongside that you also have different sources so that you're not hostage to your members, which is a very remote possibility. But similarly, based in Brussels, you know, funding from research funding from EU institutions. Yes, it's critical. Absolutely. You know, we, our lives depend on it because we have three year long research projects with which few other donors uh, provide, but it can't be the only one. It has to be accompanied by a mix of sources. And this is, I mean, this is the part of our jobs, which I think probably most of us hate, right? <laughs> um, but we have to do it. It means that we have to speak to the private sector. We have to speak to the public sector. We have to uh, uh, speak to foundations, investi investigate all the possibilities and make sure that the actual model is diversified. 
so that we can't be subject to accusations um, of being biased, of being, uh, you know, paying lip service to certain companies or be confused with the lobbying. And again, and in Brussels, there are quite strict rules on lobbying. And they, they, they write down, if you go and visit an official, your name is logged and then, you know, it's open to the public. Um, so one can easily be accused of lobbying. So it's absolutely critical um, that the diversity that the diversity is, is in the model and not just on, on the projects or the area. Thank you. Look, I think we've we've uh, we're ten minutes over the hour, so I think we might wrap it up there. Before thanking the panelists here today, let me just remind people of the final few events we have for this 30th anniversary week. Tomorrow we have a 200 with the finance minister and president of the Euro Group, along with the chief economist of the European Central Bank. Then in the afternoon, we have both the French foreign minister and Europe minister together. And finally, on Friday, we have the chair of the US Congress's Ways and Means Committee. Uh, and that'll bring our week to, the, to, to a conclusion. Um, let me thank uh, our three panelists today for a very open, frank, uh, in, insightful discussion about the role of think tanks and their own organizations. Uh, certainly those of us on, uh, at the Institute have found it useful uh, to share those thoughts and I hope you have too, those of you who consume uh, what we at Think Tanks do. Uh, let me give the final word to Tony Brown. Tony was one of the people who brought about the Institute 30 years ago, along with uh, Brendan Halligan, the founder. He mentions that Brendan's vision of a think tank was informed by his knowledge of two think tanks. That's yours, Natalie, um, through, as you mentioned, Alquiero Spinelli, um, both uh, Brendan and Alquiero Spinelli were members of the European Parliament, and Brendan knew him from there. And his, his other vision of a think tank came through yours, uh, Robin, through his contact with uh, William and Helen Wallace, who were uh, giants of your organization. Um, so look, uh, thanks to all three of you again, and for everyone who's tuned in, um, wishing you all a good afternoon. Thank you. Thank you.